this week on the Back Table Podcast. When somebody gets 90% relief for a chronic, unremitting problem, you cannot lock your office door tight enough to keep them out. I mean, they will find their way back to you. So this is one of those things. I like it because I don't have to convince. I don't have to give advice. I say, here's what it is. Here are the numbers where you should be. Here is our personal experience with this therapy. Let's do a test drive. And by the time they come back to have the leads pulled out, they're like, okay, when can I get this schedule? And I'm not leaving until I know when I can have one of these put in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Do you have patients suffering from neuropathic pain like diabetic neuropathy, spondylosis, or degenerative disc disease despite or even after trying conventional medication and treatments? Chronic pain drastically impacts quality of life and is often refractory to conventional treatments. Nevro HFX Spinal Cord Stimulator could help. Although spinal cord stimulation has been around for decades, Nevro HFX is the only one approved by the FDA to provide paresthesia independent 10 kilohertz therapy. In a large randomized controlled trial with painful diabetic neuropathy patients, Nevro HFX demonstrated 80% pain relief at 24 months with 65% of patients having improved sensory function. If you have patients suffering from neuropathic pain and conventional medical management is not working, recommend Nevro HFX. Learn more at hfx4pdn.com. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast. This is Dana Dunleavy from Buffalo, New York. Douglas Beal, tremendous, tremendous honor. Thank you for burning a weekend with me. You really need no introduction for many reasons, but maybe we could, while the topic is so hot right now about IR and DR surviving together, talk a little bit about your life. People talk about you with such reverence. You know, maybe I could just say that you got fired from your job and that's why you're the man you are today. The honor is mine, Dr. Dana Dunleavy. Yeah, it's an interesting path and I think most of the time to realize where we are, you have to realize where you don't want to be. And I came out of the military, started practice and the military, my office was actually in the department of orthopedics. And, you know, I'd come back after a fellowship in MSK radiology from Mayo Clinic and really started off in interventional and was really, I was taken by the military and didn't really have a chance to finish that fellowship. And I was placed in the Department of Orthopedics and kind of worked that as an amalgam, worked a lot with those guys. And then when I went to University of Oklahoma, I did interventional call, which is every third night at a level one trauma center and had a chance to work with orthopedics and work as an IR, you know, not even having finished a fellowship in it. And then when the, the chairman changed, what I had set up at the time, I had developed what I called clinical practice programs. And these were kind of an amalgam. These were problem solving and pain solving and issue solving programs where people would come in. And at the time they were doing almost no vertebral augmentation. And so I set that up and immediately went from zero to hundreds of cases a year, a lot of which were fed by level one trauma center, a lot of which are just garden variety osteoporotic vertebral fractures, as you know. And then they would come back and they'd have uh, back pain that was unrelated with extension, with twisting. So, okay, well, that's a different pain. Let's uh, do some facet injections. They'd come back with radiculopathy and I'd, I'd do epidural injections and do kind of an amalgam and very quickly expanded to doing pretty much everything. You know, I saw people with complex regional pain syndrome and then got into neuromodulation and grew it really way beyond the bounds of just simple augmentation. You know, we've always had these skill sets and always had and kind of played around. I remember it in residency at, and I did it in Baltimore at the Johns, same as you, Dr. Dunleavy. And uh, we would do injections and we would do anything, intermental spine in its formative years. And I brought those techniques to bear. And then when the chairman changed, the new one came in and shut down my clinical practice programs. And, you know, that really was at the point in time, that was the primary thing that I wanted to do. That was my identity professionally. This is what I was publishing on. And I just didn't see 
a reason for it. And I didn't see a reason to stay if I wasn't going to be allowed to do this. And so I did a thing that I would not probably do today. I don't know if I would have the fortitude to do it today. I just flipped the resignation letter on the desk of the new chairman, said, I know I should give you two weeks, but you shouldn't have shut down my clinical practice programs. I quit effective immediately. And I went to a solo private practice at an affiliate hospital just in the north part of the city. And I didn't know how to code. I didn't know how to bill. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't really, I barely even had a place to land. I had no staff, I had nothing. And within about a couple of months, I thought, you know, I can do this. And within about six months, I said, I definitely can do this. And within a year, you couldn't pry it from my cold, dead hands. And, you know, developing all of this is a problem solving. You'd see various and sundry patients. You get referred to primarily by your clinical practitioner partners and, and then friends and family. And where I am today is just, it's over 50% word of mouth. You know, it's, I'm not part of a vertically integrated network. I was solo for 18 years before I got partners this past year. And it's just been kind of a native way to grow. I think some of the things I really like doing now are seemingly not popular for some groups. For example, intrathecal pain pumps. I don't think they have a great reputation. They're fantastic. That's the secret is they're fantastic. And it's just been passed down. And so vertebral augmentation is not done by interventional pain very much, but that's the single best thing we do in terms of patient satisfaction and outcomes. And it's like the old adage, you know, don't fill cement into the posterior third of the vertebral body. That's an old adage. It's been said many times, and it's wrong now, just like it was wrong the first time people said it. And not only that, it's things are passed down, don't do pumps, you're married to the patient. What does that mean? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. And people are afraid of things like spinal cord stimulation, neuromodulation, because people perceive it as complicated. And the, the difference between complicated and uh, complex, complex is like a, a jet engine. It's like disassembling a Ferrari. Complicated. You know, my wife is complicated. So there's a big difference between complex and complicated. And just because something's complex doesn't mean you can't figure out, attach a generalized algorithm to it, be successful. And that's kind of the way that we've navigated the world of what is termed MSK intervention. A lot of people call it interventional spine, interventional pain. It goes by uh, a number of different words, but, you know, essentially this is minimally invasive spine surgery and this is radiologic surgery or some other name that we need to develop to adequately describe it. But what this is, this is a minimally invasive problem solving way to propagate people's lives, improve their function, increase their quality of life, decrease their pain and improve their ability to participate in life all the way until the time that they get older. I love it. And part of the reason I bring it up is there's so much interest in what you alluded to, which is, can I do it? Right. And I think everyone knows no matter what, you'd find a way. But some people want to figure out how difficult is it going to be and, and whether it's Doug Beal's practice or some of my colleagues locally that have built the largest and most successful and highest quality practices. There's something about their prior groups that they felt they were being held back and they could do better by patients by doing it independently. And that's why they moved in that direction. I think that what you provided is tremendous support across the country for anyone that wants to do what you've done. So they're not going through that really difficult first year that you did. The billing and the coding is there, kind of all the aspects of finances is now available. So there's a lot of mentoring. The local neurosurgery group, which is world renowned for endovascular neurosurgery, the chairman was actually let go twice because he was such a pioneer in that world. And now, again, they're the leaders. So it's very interesting. We recently talked to the founders of Travelier, which is a group of physicians doing interventional radiology to cover underserved hospitals. And again, I think without guidance from you and others, um, would be very challenging for them to pull that off. The aspect about being a pioneer, you can always tell a pioneer because he's the guy with all the arrows in his back. And that's, there's a lot of truth to that. And, you know, doing things out of the box is welcomed by some people, not really welcomed by others. And being at the, the cutting edge sometimes is a sharp, hard edge to ride. And it works in your favor sometimes, sometimes not. But 
the real advantage I think that all interventional radiologists have, regardless of their focus, whether they're MSK, IR focused, or IO or IR vascular, the real secret we have is that we're just great at guiding things under minimally invasive situations, under fluoroscopy, under CT. We have three-dimensional knowledge. We're able to guide things under cross-sectional imaging very well. And that's not the case for all the specialties. We've got, we passed the Bear Bryant test. I mean, we used to go through Goob and yank somebody out of the, the rack in the middle of the night. They'd land in the ready position. And we passed that test. We land in the ready position, ready to guide stuff under fluoro. Our formative years, we had a bottle in one hand guiding a needle through soft tissue under fluoro or CT with the other. I mean, that's where we came from. That's the heritage. That gives you the ability to do this on your own. You go out and if you practice clinical excellence, if you're just better at your job than any other specialty, there will always be a place for you, regardless of what you do, where you are. Just be better at clinical outcomes. Put the patient first. Put your outcomes as a primary goal. Measure what you do. One of the secret things that I've done over the years that's really helped me is that, you know, I've been a round peg in a square hole for my entire career. And I've had numerous people say, and it's just only abated in the last few years, but, oh, you, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, you shouldn't, wh why are you doing this? That's not within your specialty. You, sh you're, you shouldn't be doing that. And one of the things that I've done to kind of deal with that, to mitigate the impact of those statements is I've measured everything that we've done. You know, I've run our 58th clinical trial. I've got four registries going on simultaneously now. And what this does is it's a huge advantage because you can say, well, if you think I shouldn't be doing this, let me tell you that my average pain score goes from a nine to a 1.4 after a kyphoplasty, that on the average, our sacroplasties produce a 6.4 point reduction that's better than anything that's been measured in the past five years that our pain pump people get off their opioids reproducibly. So, I mean, this collection of data not only kind of forestalls additional critical comments, but it also allows you to figure out where you are. It gives you your dashboard to figure out how you're doing and how much you're helping people. And also, it's valuable in terms of collecting and publishing level one evidence. You really can contribute to the science a lot, and it makes you attractive to industry. And what industry does is I remember, I'll give you some little bit of inside baseball. We we're doing a clinical trial and one of the sponsors of the clinical trial sent me an errant email and I got this spreadsheet showing that the Cleveland Clinic was getting reimbursed twice as much per patient as I was. And I was pretty mad about that and kind of let it go and just didn't do much about it, thought about it. I mean, why in the world are they getting paid twice as much? and talked with my research coordinator. And uh, she said, well, they probably is, they just have a lot more steps to go through and they're probably just a lot more expensive with the bureaucracy. You know, I come to think that that's probably true. And I talked to the sponsor a little bit about what they were reimbursing and they made the comment that the research coordinator at the uh, sponsoring medical device company said, yeah, you know, we wish you had a lot more sites like yours because you enroll lots of patients that are appropriate patients for the therapy and you're a lot cheaper and things go, in general, a lot faster. And so I kind of understood that this is how we do it. We're small, we're nimble, we enroll appropriate patients, we have very little bureaucracy, one signature does it all, and that's why sites like ours are so attractive to industry, pharma, medical device, and even the NIH, people who review these things, because you know we're doing multiple research projects, we're enrolling lots of patients, and we're getting really great results, then it's not costing a fortune to do it. Yeah, it's so important. You know, even yesterday, there was a discussion online between vascular surgery and interventional radiology about the lack of evidence of some of the things that we do. And if you look at the work you've done, tremendous evidence behind it. And sometimes we talk about, you know, a significance of reducing a, a VAS score by two, and many of the things we're talking about reducing by seven or eight, really incredible. And I think with that, maybe we could move right into how you got involved with neuromodulation and how it impacts your practice in your region. So I'd seen neuromodulation at Hopkins 
some of the guys that were there that I'm friends with now, Stats and others, I remember seeing that. And then I got into practice and I had somebody with complex regional pain syndrome, the formerly known as RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And it was a real problem. And I thought, you know, these, these are home run cases for neuromodulation. And this was early 2000s. And so, you know, I reached out to my Medtronic rep, who was president accounted for during the neuromodulation and pump business. I said, you know, I want to put a stimulator in this guy. And he said, uh, okay. And then I said, well, w- when can we do it? Let's get him on the schedule. And he said, let me get back to you. And it was literally like a month later. And I, I said, Todd, what's up with this? Why can't we get this done? He goes, well, we can't train you on it. So, well, okay. I didn't know that I needed training to do this. It's just putting leads in the epidural space. And he said, oh, okay, well, we can do it tomorrow. And so that was a Tuesday. We did it on a Wednesday. It was a two-lead trial. And after we finished, he said, boy, that was easy. And I said, yeah, this wasn't a big deal. And uh, later, it wasn't until much later, I found out that it was a controversy. Medtronic didn't want to train a radiologist to do neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulation. And, you know, it's similar to what we face with kyphoplasty. I mean, this is, they didn't want to train radiologists to do kyphoplasty. They thought it was only a surgeon. and I'm hitting for the cycle here, Dana. They didn't train me to do pumps either because they didn't want to alienate their primarily anesthesia-based colleagues. And hey, I get it. I mean, that's okay. So as you know, some of our colleagues are still embittered by the kyphoplasty problem. And they're still roiling over that. And that was in the late 90s. (laughs) I think they need to get past that. I mean, let's stuck like the woman with the hairstyle from the 80s. They need to, they need to, let's get past that. And uh, so we did the neuromodulation, the trial, and this, as you know, neuromodulation works really well for a couple of things. It is just a home run for CRPS. For neuropathic pain, it just is the champ. It, it does the job. I mean, really, you can have 80% remitter rate on this now. And for painful diabetic neuropathy, we've got a 90% response rate. That's just crazy. And then the remitter rate for that is right around two thirds, about 65% are just gone, have the painful diabetic neuropathy gone for high frequency neuromodulation. And so I put this in and started doing it. And that was back in the day where we would be able to get leg pain. We'd be able to, for radiculopathy, we'd be able to treat complex regional pain syndrome. We would not reliably be able to treat back pain. And then we've gone through lots of iterations Occasionally, I would try to use it for painful diabetic neuropathy or a PDN. And about one in four, one in five, I would hit it over the fence and the patient would do great. And it's the cruelest type of thing because they would do great. And then the other next three or four just were duds. And all of this was done with tonic stem. And so the tonic stem is for our listeners not familiar with it. It's uh, this goes all the way back. I mean, First one of these done was done by a guy named Norm Sheely, a neurosurgeon in Minnesota. And he hypothesized that he could stimulate the A-beta fibers, which is, that's non-nociceptive. And, and then the, that would interrupt the nociceptive signal from the A-delta and the C-fibers. And the first one was put on the spinal cord, which was pretty heroic, especially in the 60s. It was in 67. And then uh, it was for intractable cancer pain. And then later on, I mean, they have external systems and then the IPG wasn't developed until I think it was 81 when Medtronic came out with their implantable pulse generator. And then the systems we had now are really the kind of systems that I had. And this was a tonic system. These are low frequency stem. It put paresthesia, uh, which is numbness, tingling, thumping. People describe it as a different sensation and also different frequencies will produce different sensations. But the sensation blocks the pain. And so you have a paresthesia in the place where you hurt, you block the pain. It's a gate theory from Melzack and Wall. And then the patient typically does pretty well. And then it's a real struggle at that point in time from when we started putting it in to use it for things like back pain and use it for things like painful diabetic neuropathy. And it didn't really do very well until just recently. And with the advent of certain different waveforms, frequencies, and techniques, have we really been able to kind of hit it over the fence for back pain and painful diabetic neuropathy. Can you explain a little bit what is a paresthesia and why do we care? 
Yeah, so paresthesia is done with uh, low frequency stem. Low frequency stem is less than a thousand hertz or so, and then you go from one to three thousand. It's higher frequency. Some companies call it high density programming. And then the high frequency is the proprietary high frequency is 10,000 hertz. And the 10,000 hertz is sub perception. So once you get above a thousand hertz, you start not being able to feel it, but it becomes neuro inhibitory. So paresthesia based is sending exactly stimulating the A beta fibers and blocking the pain and it, it provides a sensation. And it does really well because the dorsal columns and the spinal cord, the, that's where the nerve tracks to the legs live. And you're able to get leg and hip pain pretty well. And, you know, it has to do with the position on the spinal cord. And once you get up to about T8 that's, and T9, that's the reason that will stimulate the low back the best. But the low back fibers are farther lateral, so it doesn't get those quite as well. And so you have paresthesia based, which is low frequency. And then you have non-paresthesia, which is high frequency, all the way from high density to all the way up to HFX or HF10. These are proprietary waveform 10,000 hertz stimulation. And what this does is it really stimulates the dorsal horn and it's kind of is neuro inhibitory and turns down the pain transmission. And because it's not selective in terms of anatomic. So whenever I did the trial for our patient, my first one was CRPS, he had a uh, right foot pain and right leg pain and skin changes below the knee and, was, and you know, typical CRPS syndrome. And I, I placed it and made sure the paresthesias covered that right leg. And I kind of put two leads in there to make sure it just covered both sides. You can stimulate one lead or the other, but I put a, two leads for redundancy, but he got great relief in that right leg. But as long as the paresthesias were there, that was good. And you'd have to anatomically map. So you put them on the table. Uh, I do these with sedation. Van Ellenberg said nothing special. And I trolled the lead from about... T8, which is back to about T11, which is legs and a little bit below T11 will get below the knee. And the, everybody's a little bit different. Transitional lumbosecular anatomy is present 15% of the population. So you have to be sure and count and make sure you have the right level. But you troll until you cover the painful area with that paresthesia, with the numbness, tingling, electrical feeling. And then that is your goal for a uh, tonic stem for low frequency stimulation. For high frequency stimulation, you put the leads at the 9-10 interspace, overlap them by two electrodes, leave it and go home. And if you turn that, that on, people have done this, it's anatomic placement rather than a sensation placement. If you turn it on, you feel it somewhere in like the front of one leg or around the knee. It's not really done for the purpose of paresthesia stimulation. It's done just for it's neuroinhibitory function to turn down the pain transmission. And, you know, I've found a combination of these two techniques would be really advantageous. We've gone from just tonic stimulation, low frequency stimulation. We've gone to stimulation with differing waveforms. We have DTM, differential target and multiplex. We have pulse stimulation patterns. We have multi-phase stimulation patterns. We've got high frequency stimulation. We've got feedback loop systems. And now some of the more modern low frequency stimulation have a feedback loop to call the ECAPS vote compound action potential. And it, it adjusts the stimulation with it at the same rate that, that it is the frequency. So it's kind of like a built-in rheostat kind of keeps you in, in the, the therapeutic range. But, you know, the one that I use the most for things like painful diabetic neuropathy is without question the high frequency stimulation. That's been, in my experience, just uh, it's one of those things that you place it and you tell the patients that we're about 90 for 90. We have about 90% of patients that get 90% pain relief. And that's been based on my own experience, but the new data comes out. It came out to 24 months data. It said we have a 90% response rate. And to that, I say, yeah, you know, I agree. This is one of the, one of the things in the medical literature that I actually believe because, <laughs> because it, correlates and it agrees with my own experience. And so just to simplify that for our audience that might not have as much spine experience, you know, we're talking about the initial, you know, neuromodulation that you were doing before 2015, which was paresthesia inducing. And after that high frequency, which is paresthesia free, 
And also the difference is that, as you said, you're not mapping if you're doing high frequency, you're just putting it at a location. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that the IR physicians have in their armamentarium, they do a lot of treating of peripheral arterial disease. They treat people that are diabetics, treat people that are smokers. They see a lot of leg pain. They get a lot of referrals from uh, podiatry. And this is exactly the same patient population that will have painful diabetic neuropathy. There's about nearly 6 million people in the U.S. with PDN. And I didn't used to not like that disease process because you'd try a little gabapentin. It would be ineffective mostly. You'd have about a 50% hit rate on that. And and the, the patients typically had problems with the gabapentin side effects. And a lot of them didn't like it. And then you'd try tonic stem and that was very effective for about one in four patients, but kind of marginally effective otherwise. I mean, the average pain reduction is 50% at best. And then the high frequency stimulation is fantastic. It's, as I said, 90 for 90. And, you know, I'm kind of out of the typical IR practice. I mean, I haven't done angiography in a decade or more, probably 15 years, and we're just so busy treating the, what you would call interventional musculoskeletal patients. We have more people that we need to see than we can possibly see. And so we tried to expand, but this is one of the areas of solid overlap, but there's huge overlap between the people, the IRs that do peripheral arterial disease and see these patients that have pain. So you do, you know, you open up the the vessels. The other common area is spinal stenosis. You know, you make sure they don't have claudication or neurogenic claudication. But after that, you confirm that they're good to go on both of those regards. And then you have a patient left with PDN that you don't know what to do with. And this is something that spinal cord stimulation neuromodulation is tailor-made for the outpatient environment. I mean, this is done, almost all of this is done best in the office for trials and then an ASC environment for trial or permanent implantation. And I think many people may not realize how enormous the PDN problem is. You know, when you and I have talked either with our interventional radiology colleagues that do a lot of vascular work, either venous or arterial, or our discussions with vascular surgeons, we would say that some of our documented numbers, so we talk about 28 million patients in the U.S. with diabetes, 14 million with neuropathy, and about 6 million that probably are appropriate for treatment with neuromodulation based on failed pharmaceutical attempts. Almost every discussion I have with vascular surgeons who have no reason to feel inclined to do this procedure say that those numbers are a big underestimate and that the most disappointing aspect of their practice is the fact that they revascularize a patient with, you know, critical limb ischemia and the patient's disappointed in them because they still have peripheral neuropathy or diabetic neuropathy. So number one, I think you've very clearly elucidated just how successful neuromodulation is for PDN. In fact, more successful than failed back surgery or non-surgical back. But what about some of the incredible findings of this two-year data about innervation? Can you talk about some of the studies on that? You bet. I want to go back half a click and scope and scale this a little bit based on what you just said there, Dan, if that's all right. So typically we would take people with back or leg pain and we would have about a 50% response rate. And a 50% response rate specifically means half of the patients, we were able to cut their pain in half. We were able to reduce their pain by 50% and 50% of the patients. That was the typical response rate for tonic stem. Then we've kind of bumped up. I mean, some of the, the high frequency stimulation we bumped the 50% up to 80%. We're able to cut the pain in half 80% of the patients. And that was kind of the new level. That was the new area that we were getting to. And we would have about half of the patients that were profound responders, which means cutting the pain by 80% or more. And if you cut the pain by 80% or more, basically it's a, the other term we apply there is a remitter. Because you know, if you have a one or two out of 10 pain, having reduced your pain by 80%, but that's just pain with life, right? That's effectively no pain at all. If you're complaining about a one out of 10, then we can't be friends anymore. That's just the the way things go. So we've taken that, we've raised the bar up and we have about that, we've got 80% for non-surgical low back. We have 80% 
and almost 60% responder, profound responder. Those are pretty good. I mean, those are 60% remitter and non-surgical low back. And these are patients that either can't have surgery due to comorbidities or don't want to have surgery based on their own preference. And then we've taken it to 90% response rate for PDN. The most recent data was released, the two-year data. And then the profound responders are 65%. I mean, two-thirds of people are remitters. And that's, that's just a tremendous number. And, and this is why we gravitate toward epidural injection for acute radiculopathy. We gravitate for vertebral augmentation for fractures. And we gravitate for high-frequency stand for PDN because these things just work. <laughs> they work. I mean, for sure, patients come back and they're like, I don't know, it's not like I feel a little bit better. They're like, oh my God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the other thing that's really interesting that, you know, I, I wasn't expecting at all. And in fact, I, I'm not sure I believe the data when it first came out. We tend to be a little bit skeptical. I think, I think it's a healthy skepticism. But the data came out that about two thirds of the people, a little over 60% of the people, they had improvement in their neurologic function and their testing. The motor testing, the sensory testing, and the reflex testing. And the testing was uh, filament testing and it was standard neurologic evaluation. I'm doing temperature testing, two-point discrimination, and filament testing for one of our research studies now. And it's quite painful. It takes a while, but it's very accurate. And so is this. And we found that about two-thirds of the patients had demonstrable improvement in their neurologic function and sensory function which is also, of course, neurologic, but this is profound. It happens in two-thirds of the patients. And it was so important because there's not any other medication, any other strategy, anything else that I've ever seen that does that. I think this is unique. And what is the mechanism? I mean, it's the mechanism of action. I don't even want to hypothesize on that. There's a lot of things. We could talk about that for an hour, but Thank God we won't. We'll just kind of skip to the fact that there's a, um, a study specifically focusing on the primary and secondary endpoints or neurologic, the neurologic function of the patients. And if you're able to actually reverse the disease process, and if there's one thing that you could certainly say about painful diabetic neuropathy and neuropathy in general, it's just not reversible. And, you know, I had held that as a truth for many years, but it looks like it is reversible, at least in a certain portion of the patients. And driving up this morning, I heard, I had the radio on and, and I heard an advertisement for four different neuropathy clinics around the city where I live. And it was non-invasive treatment of neuropathy. And I was, how about that? I mean, I'm reviewing a, a legal case now where one of the non-medical specialists, and I use the specialist in the air quotes, was treating the patient with neuropathy with things like massage and light therapy and vitamins, a, a vitamin and mineral cocktail and some of the other things. And I, I think that's all well and good, but it's not going to work. They, these things and, and the response rate, even to the membrane stabilizers. I mean, we've got gabapentin, pregabal, and you've got tricyclics, amitriptyline. You have, you know, Cymbalta, duloxetine. I mean, these things work just mediocre to poor. If you were to put them on a scale of one to 10, they work about a three or a four level of good. And uh, of course, there's no scale for that, but I just I want to give the listeners this to see, to have all of the, the therapies that you could apply all of them and they still are mediocre to poor outside of high frequency spinal cord stimulation. That's the only thing that I've found, the single thing that exists that will improve and reverse the neuropathic changes, the neuropathy changes. And it's the, by far the best thing in terms of symptomatic improvement. I live in a city of about a little over a million people, much the same as you do, Dan. And why are there four clinics around? I mean, it's a small city, four neuropathy clinics, because it's common. You know, we, you mentioned about 6 million people with painful diabetic neuropathy. I think that's, I realize it comes from the CDC numbers, but I think that's a gross underestimate. It seems to be maybe half of those are split between our two cities. <laughs> Is there seems to be, I mean, PDN just comes in, we should, but we don't advertise for it. We just kind of use the mantra, you know, if you hurt, come in and see us and we can, we'll figure it out. We're a non-chronic opioid clinic. And, you know, there are so many good things. And this is an example of one of those things that it's non-medications, non-opioid. And for people, their responders, which are 90% of people respond well to the trial, it's going to be life-changing for them. And it's 
one of the two things I do that you can actually test before you do the implantation, the surgeries. The implantation is a surgery. It's a minimally invasive light surgery, but it's a surgeon. You don't want to give people anesthesia of any kind until you deem it necessary, but you can do a test drive, a trial. And when somebody gets 90% relief for a chronic unremitting problem, you cannot lock your office door tight enough to keep them out. I mean, they will find their way back to you. So this is one of those things. I like it because I don't have to convince. I don't have to give advice. I say, here's what it is. Here are the numbers where you should be. Here is our personal experience with this therapy. Let's do a test drive. And by the time they come back to have the leads pulled out, they're like, okay, when can I get this schedule? And I'm not leaving until I know when I can have one of these put in. So this is, uh, it's been practice changing and it's for a very common problem. Yeah, I think that's such a rewarding aspect of it. The trial is so easy for us and for the patient and for the family. And it really is unique, right? In that you can do this very simple test drive, as you said, and you and I both try very hard to make sure that authorization is in place for the PERM because these patients finish their trial. Not only does it change their life, but as that trial finishes, they go back to the pain they were in before and they're pretty mad, right? I mean, they, they want that success that they had as soon as possible. So to your point, right, it, it shouldn't be months down the road after the trial, ideally. And so again, that's a really nice aspect. I want to get a little bit nerdy and go back to some of the things you mentioned in terms of the success of high frequency neuromodulation. And you've used terms like number needed to treat with vertebral augmentation. We also have some data on that in terms of gabapentin number needed to treat is about eight. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors number needed to treat is about six. And with high frequency neuromodulation, number needed to treat is only one. What does that mean? So NNT, we love NNT because it gives people personal experience. You know, how many people do you need to treat to have a treatment success? And you can identify the treatment success as however you want. I mean, for me to have a responder means I cut their pain 80% down decrease. That to me means they're a responder. And gabapentin's around eight. You know, I've seen a study recently that said uh, that was a little bit more permissive on the gabapentin. And they said the number needed to treat for some margin of success, which may, you know, I didn't, it didn't say, or I didn't see it, it was, it was three, but the number needed to treat for a complication or side effect was four. So, I mean, it, it, and that's the thing about gabapentin. I mean, by the time you get up to the point where it's making a neurologic improvement in the neuropathy, it's also giving a side effect because of the way it functions. I mean, a lot of people don't like it because of the, the fog that it leaves them in. It just kind of gives them a strange feeling. It can make them sleepy. And it's kind of the same thing with the uh, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, the dual oxetine. And so a lot of these things we, the patients just don't like, and they just don't like it well enough to continue to do that. And the number needed to treat for spinal cord stimulation is just a little over one. So basically it's right at 1.3 to be specific. So almost every single person that comes through the door will have a treatment success as how it's defined. And so it's not everyone. If it were everyone, it would be one. So for every person that comes in, that means number needed to treat for a treatment success, one to one, that would be everybody. If it's one and two, the number needed to treat for treatment success is two. And so th this should give everyone an idea about how effective this is. So if almost everybody gets uh, treatment success, it's a pretty darn good treatment. It puts it right up there with everything that we do. It puts it up there with vertebral augmentation and we have mortality numbers for that, but the number needed, we've never measured the number needed to treat for vertebral augmentation, but it's going to be right at one, maybe slightly over. And this is one of the few therapies I know that are uh, just reliable to the point where you can almost, it's almost money in the bank that you know that the person is going to get better. And just to get nerdy once more, because you and I are known for this, what is intraepidermal nerve fiber density? And in talking about that, you know, I think that our nation has done a wonderful job of improving awareness of breast cancer, diagnosis, screening, treatment, not as well with this, right, about treatment for diabetes, diabetic neuropathy. And just to start, as we talk about nerve fiber density, what has a higher mortality, breast cancer? or a diabetic foot ulcer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
So the, what happens with a diabetic foot ulcer is they get an ulceration and then they have vascular problems. They get it infected. Then they get an amputation and their, their mortality rate is right up there and exceeds many cancer mortality rates. And so this is, by the time you see somebody with a diabetic foot ulcer, that is the time to pass time probably to throw everything at it. You want to get the, the, the person before they develop that ulcer. And you want to make sure, as we stated previously, that the arterial supply is adequate. You want to make sure they, the activity is adequate. And in addition to, we always say PDN with the P being painful, just the diabetic part of the numbness part of it is it can wreak havoc. So somebody's diabetic, they have no feeling. They walk over a straight pen. I've seen this pencil. They stub their toe. They just have a ulceration from ill-fitting shoes. Uh, you know, we've seen all of this and that is kind of the, the, the tipping point. That's the beginning of the end for that lower extremity as it goes through and the ulceration can't heal. They can't continue to can't feel it. They will get, you know, transmitted tarsal amputation. They'll get a, or show parts. They'll get a, they'll get a long BKA will shorten up to short BKA. I mean, the, this is just the beginning of the end for a, a lot of people like this. And that's one of the things that, um, the mortality for these patients is exceedingly high. And I would like to really catch these people before that happens. And that's why the neurologic study is so important. I mean, measure the fiber density, and that's an objective finding on transdermal biopsy. You can measure the motor sensory and the reflex improvements, and you can measure the two-point discrimination and the numbness. And these are things that are objectively improved, at least on the two-year data, we, we found that two-thirds of the patients had objective improvements in these categories. And I think sometimes we focus on the pain out of the PDN, but the numbness is actually one of those things that can, can really lead to an ultimate disaster down the road. And how about A1C? Yeah. So uh, the hemoglobin A1C for the, the cl clinical trials was right at seven, you know, and in terms of that's, you know, that's a little high. It's not bad. So to be in the, the, the trial, the SENSA trial, SENSA PDN was, you know, you had to have a, a BMI less than 45, which is very generous, and a hemoglobin A1C less than 10, which I think is incredibly generous. And these people had long-term neuropathic problems. They had, you know, years, six, seven, eight years of neuropathic problems. And so to take people like this and then measure what happens to them is really classic. I mean, these are, these are typical patients. I think there's a misnomer that if you have your hemoglobin A1C right around six to seven, that's pretty good for a diabetic and you shouldn't really have problems and that your neuropathic symptoms will improve. But that is just absolutely false. That is not true. You can have well controlled blood sugar as measured by the hemoglobin A1C that's right around seven. And it, it will not remit. It will not improve. It will not be of any benefit to, for the neuropathic problems. It, it can benefit other things to keep your blood sugar under control. And that's, I'm not making the argument that blood sugar control is not important. It's critically important, but it won't improve your neuropathy. And what is seen in the Senzo PDN trial is these people came in and they were pretty much typical and they were productive members of society, keeping their hemoglobin A1C under decent control right around seven, and they still had refractory symptoms until the point that they underwent um, the spinal cord stimulation. And so this is compared against uh, conventional medical management. And as we know, you know, conventional medical management doesn't do uh, hardly anything. I mean, uh, to uh, typically it's mediocre to poor in terms of treatment of diabetic neuropathy. And so I'm really excited to see what the objective findings will show us, a trial focusing on the, the neurologic signs and symptoms and improvement and having just gone through an investigators meeting where the neurologic exam and the assessment and evaluation was gone into in depth. And now as part of another trial, I'm going to have to do that. I mean, I, I realize that this is very accurate. This is going to provide good data and it's a lot more involved than just saying on a scale from zero to 100, can you mark where your pain is or on a scale from zero to 10, where are you today in terms of your pain? And it's a much more extensive 
than that. So I think we're going to get great data. We should get good improvements, past performance predicts future results. So I think two thirds of those people will demonstrate good objective improvements. And it's going to be interesting to see that the focus may change on not only symptom modification remitting, but it will focus on disease process remitting. It will actually cause improvement of the peripheral neuropathy. I think as we've, you know, circle back kind of towards the end and think about our colleagues as interventional radiologists, you know, we would never want our patients to be in a wound clinic without also having their venous and arterial disease treated. Similarly, you know, in this situation, we want the arterial and venous disease treated, and we're providing high-frequency neuromodulation. And all of the aspects you said from improved pain scores, improved A1Cs, improved nerve fiber density, you know, what we're hoping is that we have a cost savings to the healthcare system and to our nation in terms of decreased wounds, decreased hospitalization. And in that discussion, what is your thought about why interventional radiologists have held back from offering this and improving access so that you don't have so many advertisements for unstudied pain clinics? They just don't know about it, Dana. I think it's the same thing that whenever I first started, the medical device company didn't even want to let me use it because they thought they would upset the other customers. And it's, of course, that's not true. It's the same thing as, as kyphoplasty and the surgeons and the radiologists. And it's the companies realize that, hey, you know, these radiologists are actually seeing patients like this. And uh, the device manufacturer for the high frequency stimulator realizes that. And, and I remember the first time I talked to, I haven't been during peripheral arterial disease in two decades, probably. And it's not because I don't like it. I love it. But the point is, is that I see lots of these patients from a neuropathic standpoint. And these are the same exact patients that are present. And most of my IR colleagues that do conventional, what, what we think of as a conventional interventional radiology practice. And I remember talking to one of my colleagues early on about this, like, hey, you know, you really should look into this. We're, we're 90 for 90 on these things and patients do great. I bet you have some patients like this. And he goes, are you kidding me? I mean, he said, you know, most of what I see has this. And it was somebody that does a lot of peripheral arterial disease. And that's when I first kind of realized, hey, there's, as I, I took a divergence from uh, IR early on, this is kind of a, a realignment, this kind of a, a recent convergence because the patients we treat now have a huge overlap. And so the, one of the disadvantages of, of this therapy is that it's expensive. These leads and the IPG are expensive. It's technology. And that's a disadvantage, but one of the advantages is it, it's very well reimbursed. And so this, the IR development of an IR into essentially a surgical subspecialty, that's, that's what IR has become. And the IR is no longer just solely a hospital a provider, like a fish swimming in the, the stream with his mouth open, waiting for food to jump into it. So now we, we have to go out and hunt and we have to change our sites of service and we have to have offices because we are essentially a surgical subspecialty. We see patients. I mean, your mom may not know what you do for a living, but she knows you, you help Betty Lou and, and that she can come back and see you. And you have what looks like a regular doctor's office, but you have an OR in back and that's your OBL, your office-based lab. And you, you have the ability to do cases, yes, in the hospital where you climbed out of the primordial soup, but you also have the ability to do it in the ambulatory surgery center, the ASC. And so this, I mean, this is reimbursed in the hospital and it's, it's expensive technology in the hospital is reimbursed well, but I want to, I want to put some, some numbers to this so our listeners can scope and scale this. I mean, for example, you know, an office base trial, a test drive is reimbursed at about $3,500 um, in the office and the lead price is just a few hundred dollars. And the ASC reimbursement for trial is right around 9,800. And in the ambulatory surgery center, permanent IPG placement and, and two leads, it reimburses between about 31 and a half and 34, five for a permanent implantation. So out of everything that we do in the ASC, this is the single best reimbursed item and it's a single thing that allows us really to keep the doors open and the lights on. So this is something I think the listeners should know about this. You're not having to do a lost leader here. This is not just simply charity work. 
for people with uh, PDN, a disenfranchised group. I mean, this is, yes, this is a disenfranchised group because we previously hadn't had anything to treat them with, right? And then uh, our colleagues are doing great work. They do great work for arteries, peripheral arterial disease work, angioplasty and stem placement. They, their partners, colleagues are doing great venous work and they come out with vascularized worms. They're not going to get ulcers, but boy, they, they sure run the risk of wearing an ulcer on their foot because their, their foot is numb. Or if it, if it's painful, it drives them crazy. It disrupts their sleep. It creates a chronic pain scenario, but it seems like we should be able to combine these two things. And as I mentioned, the single best people to do this neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulation are interventional radiologists. And whatever I've taught courses for spinal cord stimulation, the neuromodulation, I've taught hundreds of these. And you can always tell when IR steps to the table, when there's multiple specialties involved, you just show them the epidural highway and bang, the lead is in place before you can blink your eyes. And you can always tell the uh, skill set and the visual spatial skill of an IR. And so this is right, not only in somebody's wheelhouse, I mean, this, this is a huge patient population that you can not only take care of their vascular problems, but you can hit for the cycle. You can take care of all their vascular problems, plus you can take care of the pain. And these are almost identical patient population. And I think that's a, a great point too, that there are resources out there for our colleagues that might not have had tremendous exposure to this during their fellowships, which we know there's a lot of variability in fellowships. And one of the misconceptions that I hear is that you're going to have this apposition or competitiveness from vascular surgery or neurosurgery. In fact, there's nothing more beneficial in terms of the referral pattern that I've noticed by offering trials to these patients. Number one, it's very helpful to the vascular surgeon who is treating vascular disease but can't take care of the neuropathy. And as you said, these reimburse very well. So if we are doing trials, the neurosurgeons all of a sudden are very interested because these do reimburse very well. We do the test drive for them. We can either do the PERM or we can offer the PERM to them. And I think that that's important. For instance, as you said, ideally, all of our colleagues should have access to OBL and ASC. But for those that just have OBL currently, they could do the trial and then offer the perm to someone else. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things. This is really an extension of the referral stream that we have. This is not competitive to those two groups. And in fact, if you want to be your neurosurgeon's best friend, all you have to do is tee a couple of these up. I mean, they have a successful trial. And these are easy cases to put in. As I mentioned, the surgery is a surgery, yes, but it's two small incisions. It's under the skin, with two epidural leads. And this is an easy thing to do that is very sustainable. This keeps the lights on your, in your ASC. And so you, you will make a huge fan. You know, I prefer to do all these on my own. I, I like this patient population. The medical device company will provide a rep and your rep is your unpaid employee. We'll go out and adjust the patient. We'll talk to the patient. We'll get feedback, electronic analysis and reprogramming. And it's done really by an algorithmic method. And, you know, there's thousands of patients in the algorithm that has, you've made adjustments and these patients do better or worse. And it, for each adjustment, for each patient to do better or worse, it refines the algorithm for success to improve the patient's symptoms. You learn, this is almost an artificial intelligence way to learn from your past trials and successes to make you even more successful. And, you know, it, it gives the IR doc, <clears throat> comp, it gives them a relationship with the medical device company that previously would ignore them. And the reason why they're not thought of is because of that history, but that history, just like it changed with kyphoplasty, is changing with spinal cord stimulation, neuromodulation, especially for painful diabetic neuropathy. And I think that IRs will find that they are welcomed with open arms because they, they have huge repositories of these people that can be helped greatly with the technology that's kind of a no-brainer to apply. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the other misconception is that the pain colleagues will be worried. And, and again, the diabetic neuropathy patients tend to live within our specialty in vascular surgery. So they're really not being seen currently in general. And so there's a lot of appreciation by the whole community 
that is performing pain treatments once we get involved. There's no shortage of these patients, that's for sure. I think we've kind of evolved not only in terms of companies recognizing the impact of the interventional radiologist in this area, but we've also modified and become more of a multi-specialty big tent type of attitude. As, as you know, I mean, I've trained people from surgeons to anesthesiologists to family practice physicians, and I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the big tent philosophy that if you want to do something and you're good at it and you're dedicated and committed to it, you've got great visual spatial skills, then I will help you. And this, the, by, by doing this, we create lots of good association. You know, I, I've learned more from other specialties. And, you know, uh, my wife says I haven't had a new idea since 1992, but I can steal ideas from other people and employ them for my practice. And uh, that's uh, not really a serious comment, of course, but I, I have learned lots from physiatrists, anesthesiologists, neurosurgeons, orthopedic spine physicians. I mean, it's it's been tremendous. And once we do that and kind of share the knowledge, I think we're a little bit past, we're to the point where we have great minimally invasive interventional techniques that have come light years ahead of whenever I first started in terms of efficacy. And these are things that can be employed and to treat a huge population. There's no shortage of chronic pain. This is one of the things that, I mean, low back pain, second in terms of doctor business next to the common cold, single greatest cause of disability worldwide. No shortage of uh, people with diabetic neuropathy. I and mean, these are things that are, that are growing around us everywhere uh, in terms of prevalence. And so the better we get at it, the more patients we will be successful at treating. And there's definitely no shortage of them around. And just to confirm what you've said, you know, I've observed you teaching courses on neuromodulation. And, and it's amazing. All the observers see the interventional radiologist walk into the room and, and they fear this procedure and then realize how simple and efficacious it is. So I want to encourage everyone that's interested to reach out for that. And since we're so passionate, we've gone for a while, we can close out, but maybe we could do a follow-up on technique because I know people want to hear the really simple technique, even for the perm, right, which is like a metaport, except it has five times the RVUs. And as a teaser closing out, I recently met with some pain physicians, some neurosurgeons, functional neurosurgeons talking about cancer pain and just how little resources there is for non-pharmaceutical pain treatments and how NCCN guidelines keeps bringing these interventional pain procedures to the top of the pyramid. We were talking about invasive procedures like cingulotomy, myelotomy, and really it's so important that this step is part of that algorithm. Anything that you want to tease as we come back in the future? So the cancer pain and the interventional oncologic uh, treatments, minimally invasive, that's a whole category and that's a big, big and growing category. You know, one of the biggest areas of growth in all of IR is interventional on oncology or oncologic procedures, IO. And there are people that we know that make a, their whole career out of being an IO physician. And this is very gratifying as our techniques improve, as our technology improves. We're going to find a huge area of new applications in uh, oncology, whether it be from targeted drug delivery, neuromodulation, minimally invasive screw and cement reinforcement, the neuroblative category and that includes RF, cryo, microwave. I mean, there's, there's many, many things like this, and this is a whole area that really could use a discussion to bring everyone up to speed, up to date on the kind of the current offerings. And there's no slowdown. There's a continual speed up on the technology that's coming down the pike. As an example, you know, I just met with the medical device company who's wanting to have cryo, RF, and, and microwave all in one offering. You know, you can't really have them in one box, but the idea was to have them in two separate boxes that looks like one box to be able to have an oncologic ablation machine. I think that's a tremendously great idea. So there's, there's lots of activity coming down the pike on this, and it, it will be a good topic for discussion in the future. Absolutely. And, you know, people sometimes nationally talk about my practice as obscure pain because of 
simple things like genitive femoral, pedendal, intercostal blocks, neuromodulation. This is one of the simple things. Yeah. I don't think it's obscure. I just think you're able to do things that other people don't typically do. And when they look at your practice, they don't see, yeah, you know, you do augmentation, epidural injections, facet blocks. But yeah, you're also able to do the other stuff too. And that's really what comes to the forefront because that's novel and other people are not really doing it. And I don't like to post things or just kind of garden variety. If I put things out on social media, I want it to be kind of a, hey, this is different. Or uh, maybe it's look for this or here's a lesson to do or not to do on certain things. And, and uh, you tend to focus a little bit on their arcane and esoteric. You don't really post the garden variety cases out there very much. So that's that also influences the, the perception. But I think if you're able to do the more complex and esoteric stuff, you're probably pretty darn good at the other, the other common things as well. And we'll close it out. But besides all the courses that you offer, you know, we have SIR, ASSR, OEIS, all conferences that, that you've been kind enough to offer training at. Anything you want to add as we close? Yeah. So we have presentations at SIR, OEIS, ASSR. And uh, if one of the listeners is going to the OEIS and wants to participate in our discussions, just reach out to me. And uh, I'd sure like to have an active participant. And the, one of the disadvantages about societies like the OEIS is I'm a little bit new to them because I, I tend not to, the, he is endovascular, so I, I tend not to uh, do a lot of endovascular stuff. But the upside is, is we can introduce technology we've spoken about today to a whole new segment of physicians, IR docs that might not know about this and might be slightly unfamiliar with it. But yeah, we're having a whole segment on minimally invasive spine and pain. So this is something I, I'm sure would like the listeners to, if they're interested in that, in being one of the uh, participants and one of the speakers, just reach out to me. And, you know, I think you were, you were innovative in participating at OEIS last year, which was thought to be a little crazy at first, you know, given that it's the outpatient endovascular interventional society, but there's been yeah. tremendous interest in all of those physicians that are already at OBLs and ASCs doing vascular work to offer neuromodulation for PDN. So I think this is exciting moving forward. Yeah, for sure. They, they've given us a whole block and because of that interest, I gave a presentation last year and one of the attendees came up to me afterwards and, and said, wow, <laughs> just wow. He goes, what was that? And uh, was just very interested in it. And it was uh, the point, his point was that it's a little bit foreign and a little bit interesting. And he wanted to really know more. I, I gave a talk called Fun Through Kanban's Triangle and there's all kinds of strange things in there, but IRs can look at this and say, yeah, that's in my wheelhouse. And I think they'll, that's exactly what they'll say with this session, that it, it can and should be in their wheelhouse. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening.